Hey guys, welcome back to Ox Tools. I'm Tom. So this is your 100th meatloaf episode and um, let me just start out by saying thank all of you out there that watch my videos and subscribe to my channel and support me in the way that you do. I really appreciate it and we never would have had a hundred um, episodes of meatloaf uh, without you guys. You guys um, inspire me you uh, you push me to uh, continue on with this okay and you and there is support that comes back from that so I'm learning from you too so uh, that's one of the reasons that I do this um, I show people things I, I put that knowledge out there and I get something back from you guys uh, believe it or not <laughs> so um, we got a lot of really good questions uh, I got a, a quite the list here of questions and uh, so we're gonna go through them some of them are related to uh, uh, looking at tools in the shop some are just questions about my history um, things like that so we're just gonna kinda kinda jump into that um, so you know putting these in order is kinda tough but let's uh, let's just start with uh, um, one that came through is how old were you when you got interested in all things mechanical so um, I can blame that on my dad actually and um, when I was pretty young he had a workshop in the uh, in the basement of our house and he had a little business making um, uh, uh, kick wheels uh, pottery for doing ceramics uh, so he made these things he made kits so you could uh, uh, make your own or he made complete ones and um, uh, you know they're made out of wood and they had a concrete flywheel and a shaft and uh, and a and a wheel head and some other things and uh, I remember being actually quite small and uh, going with him to a machine shop that he uh, uh, had some of the parts machine uh, there was a little diameter that was turned down on the uh, on the shaft and then the wheel heads were cast aluminum and they needed to be faced and you know some stuff like that uh, and I remember uh, you know, I think I remember the chip pan was about right here, uh, and we went over to this guy's shop, and uh, and he, my dad was talking to the guy, and uh, I'm looking in the chip pan, and like all kids, I'm really fascinated by the uh, the curly cues and chips in there, and I start to reach in there while well, this sharp-eyed machinist uh, was was hip to that, and he goes, "Hey, don't touch that stuff; it's sharp, right?" And uh, so I. I pulled my hands back. I, I remember that distinctly, right? And uh, the really funny part is that uh, I've had kids over here and and done the exact same thing. So uh, that's <laughs> so. Anyway, I was pretty young when I got exposed to some of this stuff. And um, uh, believe it or not, I didn't start out as a machinist. I really got going uh, uh, as a welder, a welder fabricator. So a good portion of my career uh, was welding and fabricating. And as I got more into the engineering side of it, uh, the shops that I worked in had machine shops, so I was exposed to that. And, um, and I ended up getting my first lathe uh, uh, through a guy that I worked for. So, uh, and then things kind of started from there. So uh, I do both. So, you know, I consider myself a metal fabricator. Uh, machining is one part of that. Um, I do welding, I do sheet metal, I do forming, uh, I do machine work, and uh, and I, I bring all those together. That's what I like to think about is my skill set. So uh, anyway, uh, so that's a couple of the questions there. And um, the um, let's see, what should we do next? Let's uh, let's go look at a tool. Oh, I know what I know what. So a lot of you guys out there um, wish me happy birthday, which was last week. And thank you very much for that. Uh, thank you, Internet, for the happy birthday. And what I would like to do is show you what the Internet bought me for my birthday, my birthday gift from the Internet. Okay? So let's go look at that. That's pretty cool. Uh, we'll check it out, and then we'll come back and we'll do a couple more questions. All right. So there's my new uh, surface plate cover from uh, Standridge Granite. Um, it came uh, last week. These are really nice. Um, this is not what I uh, what the internet gave me for my birthday. Let me show you So who doesn't like something that comes in a mahogany box and uh, so I don't think I 
I, I don't think I would have bought this uh, um, if, well, anyway, I splurged. <laughs> Let's just put it that way, okay? Uh, what this is, and uh, it's uh, made by our friends Herman Schmidt, and uh, it's a little tiny vise, and it is the absolute cutest little thing you ever saw. Um, so I saw one of these in a guy's toolbox maybe 20 years ago, and um, um, <laughs> got majorly excited about it uh, then, and then, uh, um, but really didn't have a, a use or a justification to spend that kind of money uh, to get something like this. So for my birthday, I decided I was going to treat myself to uh, to something really, really nice, and uh, and there it is. It's a piece of machinist jewelry. Um, this is. Uh, uh, you know, I just get all excited when I pull this out of the box. So uh, uh, it's a little grinding vise, and uh, it's made out of A6 tool steel, ground to very, very tight tolerances by the Herman Schmidt Company, uh, who knows how to grind, that's for sure. Um, I don't know, what is it? it's inch and a half, I think. They call it a V1.5, V0, 1.5, something like that. A um, couple of interesting points about this particular vise. Um, is um, these, uh, so it's made out of a solid block, right? But those little notches in there, these guys, uh, um, they plunge EDM, those slots in there. If you zoom in on those and look at them, uh, those, are, those, are, those are burned in, they burn them in, uh, which is a fairly expensive technique for producing a, a little groove like that. Um, um, so I was surprised when I when I examined this the first time. So anyway, internet, thank you very much uh, for just an awesome Christmas or Christmas birthday gift, der. Um, and uh, thank you very much. I'll cherish this for years, and uh, you'll see it in uh, you'll see it in videos uh, coming up. Now, um, um, for all you guys out there, you see this little cardboard thing in here. This is one of these uh, corrosion inhibiting squares. So I trimmed one down and stuck it up in the lid in there. So this emits um, corrosion inhibiting vapors uh, um, to protect uh, this little investment here. So uh, anyway, thank you guys very much. Uh, that's from uh, all you viewers out there to me and I really appreciate it. All right. So uh, a viewer sent in a question, and they were asking about calipers, okay? And I have actually quite a few calipers, um, so I figured this is actually a good subject. Uh, the question was, um, you know, what should I buy? Should I buy good ones, or should I buy cheap ones, or what? Um, so the very short answer on that is, uh, in my belief is you use these all the time so uh, if you're going to buy one nice tool make it a pair of calipers because it's really you know all of us tend to to go to these as default just to uh, uh, track our our measurements as we're working and if we need to do precision measurements and we can switch to micrometers or other methods um, these kind of keep us honest as we work uh, our way through so what I'm going to show you though is some different types okay and, um, and, and some of the different features, okay? Now, right out of the gate, I'm gonna tell you, um, these little four inch Mitatoyos are my generally go-to ones. They're nice and short, you can get them in places. And um, the other thing I really like is this round uh, depth rod. Need some crud on there. Oop, I need to get the demagnetizer on that one. It's got this round depth rod as opposed to uh, this rectangular one, right? Okay, so that's small and it reaches in places, okay? Um, one of my criteria for calipers is I'm a thumb roll guy, okay? I, they really got to have a thumb roll, and uh, I don't really care for them if they don't have a thumb roll. So the difference is there's some without a thumb roll. They just have a little pusher, little pusher block, okay? I mean, they work. They're fine, um, but you know, given a choice, I'm a thumb roll guy, okay? Now, I've almost exclusively gone to digital, just uh, um, they don't have a rack and pinion that gets crud in them, uh, so they're generally, generally a little more um, friendly uh, around chips and grit and stuff like that. So, um, 
don't know if I have my very, I don't have my very first pair, but this is a pretty old pair here. This is some old Metatoyos here. Um, these are, um, these have carbide jaws on them. So one of the things I like, to, I like about Metatoyos is they have sharp angular jaws, so scribing is really nice with these, okay? And in particular with carbide jaws, the, uh, the tips don't wear. Uh, Starrett have a, a more rounded jaw that some guys like, okay? Uh, but I don't think they scribe as well. So, uh, so you know, when you're scribing a line parallel to an, you know, look at that, parallel to an edge like that, um, you know, this sharper angle uh, does a better scribing job. The Starrett's are nice, um, but uh, I, I prefer the sharper point. Now, this, these are just my preferences, okay? Um, so now, from a mechanical nicety standpoint, okay, you know, Metatoils are they're pretty good, right? Um, but you can feel you can feel that rack and pinion as you're rotating it, okay? In in pretty much all of them, right? There's some 12 inches. These are a little smoother here, okay? Um, now, here's another pair that I used to use a lot. These are um, Etalon, uh, made in Switzerland, and these are considerably smoother for an analog type, okay? Um, so those are real nice, and uh, analog's kind of nice because you can visually see quantities, right? So, you know, I. So from there to zero, I can visually see that quantity. And when I, you know, when I look at this, I really got to think about that number and where it is in relation to uh, another number, right? Here we get a visual display of a quantity, right? Um, it's a little bit further, right? So, and as you use these, you tend to develop a sense of how much that is, right? And uh, so it really is meaningful, hey, I'm getting close. I'm getting closer. Oh, I'm getting really close. I need to switch to a micrometer or something like that, right? Okay. So these Etalons, real nice, nice and smooth. Um, I don't know. So I have an, another pair of uh, Metatoils that I leave set up with some uh, other fingers on here. Uh, I take the battery out just so it doesn't uh, weep all over that. So, you know, when you're in a shop and you're moving fast, this kind of stuff saves a lot of time uh, farting around, okay? Um, what else? Okay. What else do we have? All this stuff is like a, it's like a jigsaw puzzle to get it back in here. In fact, these don't even normally live in there. I keep these up in my office uh, when I have to measure stuff. Um, these are some 8 inch here. Um, kind of intermediate range here. So I got 4, 6, 8, and 12, and 24s actually. Um, so calipers, uh, you know, that's kind of your bread and butter. Uh, my advice is buy um, the best you can afford, okay? And if you can't afford the best ones, just get some so you have them and you start using them. If you, and then if you try uh, some higher quality ones, uh, you'll be able to appreciate the differences between them, okay? Um, see, look at that. I mean, everything's like a damn, uh, it's like a damn uh, Jenga puzzle or something like that. Okay. All right, some of the some guys uh, they asked about uh, tools, special tools that I've made for myself over the years, and you guys have seen a lot of them actually. But I, I drug out a couple that you, uh, that I'm pretty sure that you haven't seen. So uh, let's start with a uh, a little vice that I made. Okay, make sure it's in the frame there, and um, I don't I don't remember when I made this. Quite a while ago. This is when I really. You know, first started uh, getting into uh, into tool making. I think, uh, um, yeah, I, I can't think of a date when I made this. So this is made of uh, this is forty one forty two kind of pre hardened material, uh, and then these are uh, aluminum bronze guideways here. Okay, um, and it's just a little. Now it's kind of beat up. I, I'll tell you the story of why it looks so bad. Uh, and um, the, um, what was I going to say now? I don't remember. So anyway, uh, I made this vise. Uh, I designed it and I made it. And uh, um, I loaned it to a guy uh, who had a little job, right? And he says, oh, hey, I, you got a little vice I can borrow? And I, yeah, I said, sure. And first mistake, I didn't ask him what he was doing with it, right? 
And, uh, you know, I trusted him. So uh, anyway, I loaned him the vice. Well, what he was doing was he was, he was soldering um, a connection of some sort. I don't re even remember what it was. Guess what kind of flux he was using? It was some kind of nasty acid flux that's really kind of attacked this thing. And, uh, you know, he had it for a day or so, and uh, the stuff really kind of got in there and, uh, and actually pitted the thing pretty badly. So, yes, I was pissed. Um, you know, it, I don't know. You know, what do you do, right? I'm not going to scream at the guy, right? You know, I was annoyed, but uh, I certainly... Uh, you know, if he wanted to borrow something else, I asked him what he was going to do with it, right? And, um, you know, initially it wasn't a problem, but then it just kind of, I don't know, it was like a cancer. It kind of got uh, the creeping crud there. So anyway, that's the story in this vice. My friend Charlie, um, he built a uh, uh, an engraving pantograph, and he actually engraved my name in it for me, which was cool. And uh, it's got two little opposing thrust bearings that are compressed against one another, so there's there's no play in the uh, in the knob here, but it still turns freely. Okay, it's not a left-handed thread, so it's kind of backwards. So that's its one little it's one little quirk there. So there's that. Okay, and then. Here's the next thing that you guys have never seen. And uh, you go, what the hell is that, right? Um, so some of the CNC guys may, uh, may figure out what this is here. Um, this, is a, this is for touching off your tools uh, in a mill. And um, so the idea is that uh, you bring your tool down and you, and you touch this top table here, okay? And you get a displacement, okay? And then you know you know when your tool is a particular height off of the table, right? In this case, it's two inches, you know, roughly 50 millimeters. So what I wanted was I wanted a large table surface so I could bring face mills down and touch off, right? So many times face mills have one insert that's, that's hanging lower than the others, right? So if you inadvertently touch off a face mill uh, on a and it's not running, for example, you're not using a, uh, um, um, a laser probe or something like that, um, you can pick the wrong tooth and it's you know a few tenths uh, different than uh, one of the other two, so uh, teeth, cutting edges, teeth. Um, so anyway, that was the general idea and this is just a, a mechanical version of that uh, that I made. It's a, it's a prototype. Um, I had the thought that I might make some of these and, um, and give them to people to test. Um, so it's got a, it's flexure based, it's got a parallel flexure in here and some other stuff. And then it's got three little uh, contact buttons that are ground. And, um, and then it's two inches from here to the, uh, to the little buttons. So you can uh, land your tool on here and zero up. Uh, or you can add a little bit or subtract a little bit uh, uh, if you want to do some particular offset or something like that. So that's something I made as a kind of a test uh, deal, I don't know, quite a few years ago now. So, so uh, the next question is, um, and, and this is a good question too, um, a couple people, multiple people ask, what's, what's the weirdest thing you've ever been asked to make? Um, so that's actually, uh, that's actually a really good question because I've been asked to make a lot of very, very strange stuff. So uh, a couple very strange ones uh, come to mind. Uh, one, of, one of which is uh, a machine that uh, we were asked to build um, that um, would actually sniff um, cat pee. <laughs> I know some of you guys are laughing out there. But uh, inquiring minds want to know, okay? So the idea was that this was for a company um, that makes cat litter, okay? So some of you are aware of uh, the huge amount of testing and qualification stuff that happens behind the scenes for product testing. So the shop that I used to uh, manage, um, we designed and built custom machinery. So they came to us and said, listen, we, we want to uh, put varying concentrations and varying amounts of cat urine in cat litter, but we want to auto sample these things and basically uh, open the containers and have an instrument uh, take a whiff, literally give us some um, uh, quantitative uh, data from that and, uh, 
and do it over uh, over time and keep track of that so that we can uh, um, anyway they're, they're working on formulations they're testing the competition um, they're doing all kinds of things so we we built this machine and uh, you know basically a robot that held many jars of cat litter with cat pee in them and um, um, it would go around and it would it would sample the uh, uh, each jar and uh, it was looking for ammonia by the way um, it would sample each jar and uh, um, you know, give readings, and uh, they could uh, do statistical work on the uh, on the data, and and get some meaningful results out of that, or claim support, or things like that. So um, now, to me, that was that was pretty weird, right? And uh, um, but so, what's the first question that comes to mind is where do they get the cat pee from, right? So uh, it's not, you know, you don't go to the store and go, hey, give me a couple of liters of cat pee, right? Well, it turns out that there's um, um, a thriving business in uh, getting cats to pee in stainless steel trays and then collecting that urine and, urine and selling it. And uh, at the time, now this is 15 years ago or at least, yeah, 15 years ago. Um, so... 50 milliliters of, uh, of cat pee was several hundred dollars, okay? So you wanna go into a side business, figure out how to get your cat to pee in a tray and collect it, and uh, you might make some money, so. <laughs> okay, so uh, continuing on with the, uh, the weirdest thing I've ever been asked to build. <clears throat> the other one that comes to mind uh, is an interesting project. A scientist called me one day and uh, um, and you know you kind of you, when you do it enough you kind of get used to it and the, the weirdness it doesn't sound weird anymore somebody asks you to do something or you know ask you to help them you help them right so this particular guy said uh, listen I need to uh, I need to count ants you know the insects the little little itty bitty little ants right and I said okay and I didn't go why you know I just it's, you know, here's the guy's problem, right? You just treat it as a practical problem. Excuse me. Um, so he says, yeah, I need to count ants. He had a vision system. And what he wanted to do is he wanted to um, watch ants move from one area to another and actually count them as they, as they moved across uh, uh, under the field of view of his vision system, right? So um, um, this is for a company that made... Uh, uh, insecticides and um, um, you know things that kill insects okay so uh, one day I'll tell you about the cockroach lab <laughs> um, anyway um, so he needed to count ants right and uh, so I said okay um, so we talked about it a little bit and I and I, you know I did my usual thing I said okay I got I think I got what you want to do let me think about it for a day or two and, and let me get back to you right so I thought about it, I did a little reading, and, um, um, and it turns out that ants are pretty sensitive to temperature changes, and uh, uh, they don't like things when they get really hot, and they don't like things when they get really cold, right? So, so they have a, what I would say, a narrow uh, uh, tolerance band for temperature, right? So um, anyway, I talked to him again, and I said, listen, I think I got an idea, here's how I'm going to do it, and he goes, okay, great. Uh, um, what, let's make a little prototype, right? So we made a little prototype. And um, what it was was um, basically two, two areas connected by a, a narrow bridge, right? And one was where the ants would start and they would, they would go across the bridge under his camera so he could count them and they would go into this other area. And um, what I did was uh, I attached uh, Peltier heaters or a Peltier heater to the starting side and by giving it a little bit of voltage um, caused it to uh, uh, warm up and uh, so you'd put the ants in one side, it looked like a little dumbbell right with a little bridge in between right and, um, and it was all enclosed so that they could only go in this narrow little channel and they couldn't come up over the side and you know there's some other features too. Um, so anyway, I tested the thing and I was like, okay, this looks pretty good. You know, it's good enough for him to try, right? 
So uh, I gave it to him. I went over to his lab and I dropped it off and he wasn't there. And I said, okay, well, I'll leave him a little voicemail, right? So I called him and I said, hey, listen. I said, uh, uh, hey, I dropped that thing in your lab. Uh, try it out. Uh, I left a little power supply for him to use, right? And I said, hey, so that, that Peltier heater, you're going to use 0.3 volts and, um, and uh, to, you know, as your test, your starting point, right? And uh, try it out. Let me know how it works, right? So... Anyway, I don't, I don't hear back from him for a day or so, and, and uh, I, get, I get a call. Here's, this is the funny part, right? I get a call, and he goes, oh, yeah. He goes, Tom, he goes, There's this, uh, I got a problem. And I go, well, what's the matter? He goes, well, all the ants burned up. And I said, what? What, what do you mean they burned up? He goes, yeah, they just, it, this, your thing just smoked them down, right? And I'm like, really? And, uh, and I said, I go, well, how much? I go, did you use 0.3 volts? He goes, 0.3 volts. He goes, no, I used 30 volts. And I went, okay, <laughs> I think I know what your problem is, right? And uh, so it turns out that he didn't hear the uh, voicemail correctly or whatever, and uh, he used too much voltage and, and burned the ants up, <laughs> the first batch anyway. Um, so he went and tried it, and he actually was able to, uh, to count ants going across this little bridge. So another example of something weird that I've been asked to do. So uh, uh, those are two standout examples I would say. So. All right, so here's, uh, here's one of the drawers in my, uh, my machinist box and uh, somebody asked the question, they asked the question about the, uh, the little ratchet thimbles, okay? So there's, there's basically two types, okay? Actually, let's use this one here. Uh, there's two types. So this is what we call a, a ratchet thimble, okay? And what this does is it, as you um, come up on your, on your object that you're measuring, it, it limits the amount of torque that you can apply to this. Otherwise, it's truly like a C-clamp, okay? Now, you know, guys that use micrometers all the time, they have a pretty good touch and uh, so they're, they can apply a pretty consistent torque. Um, and, uh, but this, this just helps uh, the rest of us mere mortals here uh, by having basically a torque limiting device and that's how that works, okay? Now there's another type and um, that's this here and this is, the, it's the same principle but it's called a friction thimble, okay? And honestly, I prefer the, the friction thimble because you know, I have big hands, but my fingers aren't very long, so I can't actually reach up here very easily, okay? Um, so the friction thimble um, is a better reach for me, okay? Um, now, I have both, as you, as you can see here, and some micrometers, well, that one doesn't even have one. It looks like it does. Uh, this allows you to spin it a little faster, too. Uh, in this case, it's fixed. This is a blade micrometer, a blade depth micrometer, non-rotating spindle, but it's for measuring little skinny slots. Um, to, i got to fit it back into the puzzle here. Um, so here's a, a small base depth mic with a, uh, which are, with a ratchet thimble. That's a Lufkin. I like the shape of, uh, of their bases are nice. Okay. And uh, that's a Starrett. Actually, uh, that's the first depth mic I bought there. I just got that too, so uh, the ratchet thimble. Okay, uh, let's see what else is in here. So here's one that has nothing. That's an inside micrometer, okay? So it's kind of, it's opening as I, as I rotate in this direction, and it's for measuring bores and, uh, um, uh, and holes and stuff like that, so, all right. So anyway, that's the uh, ratchet thimble uh, torque limiting thing uh, that, uh, that helps you measure. So <clears throat> here's another question, uh, here's another good question. Um, somebody asked, uh, why do you do this? Um, and I, what I think they mean is the YouTube thing. And um, so let me just expand on that a little bit. And uh, so I was trained by some old guys and um, um, they instilled in me that, uh, that the knowledge doesn't belong to me. It belongs to the trade. And so as a journeyman or a, a practitioner in the, in the trade, part of my responsibility is to, is to train younger people 
and, uh, and the people that are coming up in the trades and pass that knowledge to them. So, uh, um, so if we don't do that, uh, then they have to discover all this stuff uh, on their own and it takes a long time. Um, so I feel like that is, that is a responsibility of mine. So I wrote a couple of books. Um, I uh, had a column in a, uh, in a magazine. I sit on uh, some councils that advise uh, community colleges um, uh, about uh, uh, machine tool programs, and in particular DVC here, which is uh, near me. Um, and so I, I do these things to, to further and support a trade that's been very, very good to me. And um, um, now, YouTube is an awesome way to get to a lot of people, right? So um, the feedback for me is that, that I have met people in basically every country in the world now. And uh, you know, I have pins all over maps, I get emails from people from all corners of the world asking questions, telling me about their experiences, and I am learning myself. And um, so right now, this is an awesome time to be in, uh, uh, alive and uh, you know in 1800 sure there were machinists but uh, there was one book and uh, if you wanted to go to another city you had to walk okay well I can look at the surface of another planet with a couple of clicks right here and I can talk to my friend in, uh, in Nook Greenland or uh, uh, Japan or uh, Malta or wherever that happens to be in a few seconds and, um, and all those people have unique experiences that I'm learning from. So, uh, so that's what I get out of this. And, um, um, and it's, it's, it's pretty powerful motivation for me anyway, because I love this trade so much, right? And, and I don't mean machining, I mean making things with your hands. I follow blacksmiths and, and uh, musical instrument makers, uh, trumpet builders, uh, woodworkers, stone carvers. I I follow many many bi different types of tradesmen and uh, and uh, try to learn something from all of them. And uh, so and that lead you know that kind of segues into another question. You know what is um, the best advice for young people is learn everything that you can from everybody that you can. And um, um, you know there's something to be learned from uh, the janitor. Uh, the, the plumber, the electrician, all of these people, there's, they have something to teach you um, if you're open to it. You know, if you hold your hands closed, you can't put anything in them. You have to, you have to be open, okay? So that's my advice to young people is stay curious and, and uh, be observant and, and respectful and, uh, and learn as much as you can. So uh, that's what I get out of this, okay? Um, so let's go look at something in the shop and then uh, we'll come back and we'll do a few more questions.